25. We'll be looking at verse number 21. Lamentations chapter number 5 and verse number 21. Who are our readers this morning? Brother Jesse, would you read Genesis chapter number 33 and verse number 2? And Brother Nathaniel, Ruth chapter number 4 and verse number 17. Brother Jesse, Genesis chapter number 33 verse number two, and Brother Nathaniel Ruth, chapter number four, verse number 17. I want to say it is good to see each and every one of you that were sick with COVID, 22 positive for COVID, but God has helped us only by his mercy and his grace, and for that we're so thankful. We're thankful for the others that have not been sick yet. We appreciate you being here this morning. All right, Brother Jesse, would you read Genesis chapter number 33 and verse number 2? And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph undermost. All right, did I not exhort along them lines a little while ago? Amen. Genesis chapter number 33 and verse number 2, Brother Jesse just read to us. Brother Nathaniel, Ruth chapter number 4 and verse number 17. And the woman, her neighbors, and the woman her neighbors gave it a name, saying, "There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David." Okay, I want y'all to remember this as we're preaching this morning. Jacob is bringing his family back to Bethel. Okay. Also, brother Nathaniel just talked about Ruth coming back among the people of God with Naomi. Let's read our text this morning. Lamentations chapter number five, verse number 21. The Bible said, turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Ruth needed a turning point in her life, and so did the patriarch Jacob. I want to talk to us this morning about a woman named Dinah who had a turning point in her life, and unfortunately, there appears to not have been much recovery. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We worship you and magnify you. I thank you, God, that men like Jacob could seek out the promised land. Lord, could seek out Bethel. I'm thankful that women like Ruth could come from Moab back to the house of bread to Bethlehem. I'm thankful for those that have been restored those that have been bought, brought from desolate situations. Lord, we pray that you would help me, just a humble, meek, feeble, frail servant. I'm asking you to anoint these lips of clay, set a guard at my mouth, and help me to say only the things you would have me to say. Nothing more or less. Anoint the ears of this thy people, that they might hear what the Spirit said to the churches. May we depart this place joyfully and not sorrowfully. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our text again, Lamentations chapter number 5 and verse number 21. The Bible said, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned, renew our days as of old, meaning they remembered brighter days and better times. Several weeks ago, I preached a message titled, Oh, wow, oh, how. How many of you remember where our text was found? The book of Lamentations, chapter number 3, verses number 22 and 23. This message this morning is found in the same book of the Bible. Again, our text is Lamentations, chapter number 5 and verse number 21. When Jeremiah wrote this book of the Bible, he was in a state of lamenting. In other words, he was weeping and mourning for the city of Jerusalem and his people. Jerusalem had once stood out as the city of the Lord, a city of peace and prosperity. But now he considers the current situation of Jerusalem and the situation is they are desolate. So notice with me this morning the desolation of Jerusalem. How did this happen? In chapter number one and verse number eight, we learn of the cause of of Jerusalem's destruction and desolation. Say it with me. The cause of Jerusalem's destruction. Lamentations 1 and 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. Therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her. Because they have seen 
her nakedness. Now we could preach for a couple of hours on that verse of the scripture. Uh, this word grievously means wickedly. Notice in Lamentations 1 and 8, the Bible said they have grievously sinned. Again, this word grievously means wickedly. They grievously sinned, wickedly sinned. How many of you know there is a difference between all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that they have grievously sinned. We know that we have all at some point or another been sinners or perhaps there's some in this building this morning that have been sinners. We know there are some that seemingly don't transgress as often as some others do and there are seems like levels of sin. There's big sins and there's little sins and I believe that all sinners who don't acknowledge the Lord of Christ and who choose not to surrender to him won't enjoy eternity in heaven. They'll be in eternity but they won't enjoy it in heaven. Uh, but notice that these people had grievously sinned. Their sin is the reason for the desolation of the city of Jerusalem. In other words, they went from telling a little lie to telling big lies. They went from taking something that didn't belong to them to committing some great trespass. You see, they went from sinning to grievously sinning. They went from viewing something that was inappropriate to be an addict, of doing something that's out of their control, something they couldn't stop doing. So notice with me that they didn't probably get to this point overnight or in a short period of time and no in fact one sin led to another sin one rebellion led to another series of rebellious acts and, until they were grievously sinning so one little sin led to a bigger sin I want you to notice the deterioration of Jerusalem's morals and this deterioration of the city of Jerusalem's morals led to the destruction of of Jerusalem as a metropolis. Psalm 9 and 17 said the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that do forsake God. Anytime you turn your back from God, you're going to end up in a trouble. Now, Jacob had turned his back on the band and that family situation and was making his way to Bethel, while also Ruth had turned her back on the land of Moab at a different time in history, and she's making her way to the house of God. What are we focused on this morning? What are the thoughts and the intents of our heart? This determines our direction. So their direction was leading them into paths of righteousness or into a city of peace. But here we find this nation of Israel at this point in history, Brother Road Cap, there's become a deterioration of their morals. The destruction of Jerusalem is a result of this. You see, they got to the place where they turned their back on God and began to focus on their neighbors and and their surroundings and their situations outside of God. You see, simply put, they just no longer cared about the things that God cares about. You want to know how God feels about it? Look in these 66 love letters we call the Word of God, and God has spoke to us concerning how He feels about things like marriage and morals and values and, and principles. And, and so their deterioration of morals and, and their deterioration of values and, and their deterioration of their dedication and devotion to the Lord led them into the path of destruction. How many of you feel like God's people should be dedicated to church attendance and dedicated to good morals? and principles. I believe God's people should be virtuous and care what God cares about. Amen. So Jeremiah remembers a time when Jerusalem was full of people that obeyed the Lord. They couldn't wait to get to the house of the Lord. They couldn't wait to fulfill the commandments that God had given them. They received a written request from God to obey and to obey was better than a sacrifice. They just couldn't wait 
to do whatever they could do to trigger a spontaneous revival in their life. But as we read this book of the Bible that is written by the prophet of Jeremiah, we notice there comes a time when the people would no longer listen to the preacher. Now, it, just, it shocks me. It's strange to me that somebody could come to the place where they don't want to hear a man like Jeremiah preach. And what was it in his preaching that deterred people from listening to it? What was it about his preaching that caused people to disregard what he said? They didn't seem to care about the words of Jeremiah because he is a preacher who proclaimed righteousness. Most of you know that Brother and Sister Roe Cap as well as Brother Jeremiah have been posting some sermons online and, and most of those messages have been well received and we thank God for that and God has granted us a wide listening audience to God be all the glory but there was one sermon that Brother Roe Cap posted and that sermon was called Remembering the Righteous and in there we barely scathed the surface of holiness and somebody gave that sermon a thumbs down. You see, this generation, they don't like to hear what the Spirit said unto the church and the Spirit speaks of the Word of God. There will never be a time that the Spirit of God conflicts with the Word of God. But for some reason, these people reach a time in their history where they don't care what Brother Jeremiah is saying. You don't care about your pastor when he preaches. You don't care about that elder when they testify. I've come to a place now where I no longer care to listen. You see, they didn't have time for the house of God. Is that not where we're at today? Nobody's got time for the house of God. They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and more than lovers of the house of God. They didn't want to listen to the preaching of this man Jeremiah when they heard his messages. They turned away rather than tuning in to them and repenting of grievously sinning. They were unresponsive to the preaching. They were too busy to hear the words of Jeremiah. Now I've noticed there's been some people over the years who aren't too busy to come to church, but they're too busy to be responsive to the preaching of the word of God. Now I want you to know, I said it a little while ago, the nation that forsakes or forgets God shall be turned into hell. It doesn't matter if it's America or any other country. We like Jerusalem can easily become the enemies of God. We know the Bible said to love the world. It said is to be enemy or hostile towards God. The love of the world. To love the world. Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. What is it about that world that you love? You see, in Deuteronomy, the man of God told the Israelites about the consequences of breaking the covenant and the law. You see, this word desolation is a defining word for Jerusalem at this time in their national history. I want to preach to us this morning a sermon titled, the Holy Ghost title, From Desolation to Restoration. You see, desolation is a state of emptiness or destruction, a time of anguished misery, or a time of loneliness, destruction of inhabitants, depopulation, unhappiness, and hopelessness. Does that not sound like the time upon us in these United States of America? Whatever I think of the word desolation, I think of a biblical character named Dinah. If you think about the end of her life, she is left in a house bewailing her virginity and there is nothing else said about this woman Dinah while the brothers of Dinah prosper and they're blessed and they walk throughout the pages of history this woman Dinah seems to be wallowing in a desolation what brought such desolation to Dinah what caused Dinah's desolation 
Let's ask Donna what she did, Brother Jeremiah. There came a time when her daddy was making his way from the band. It's supposed to be going to Bethel. But at some point, the Bible tells us that her father, Jacob, began to will and deal with Hamar, the mayor of Shechem. And Hamar sold Jacob a piece of a property. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, does it? To settle down and put down roots whenever you haven't really got to, to where you're supposed to be. Huh? And so the Bible says that Jacob pitched his tent outside of Shechem. Now, Shechem is also the name of the prince of the city. So this man, Hamar, had named his son after this city. This lets me know that this man, Hamar, really loved where he was living. He really loved the ways of the Hivites, which are Canaanites. He loved everything about this city. I mean, it's his world. It's his life. And Jacob and Hamar have a business real estate transaction, and Jacob settles down for a while. He gets at ease outside of the will of God, and we find him pitching his tent while looking at the gates of Shechem. Now, we feel like it's not bothering Jacob, and it's not bothering Leah, and it's not bothering Rachel, and it's not bothering the brothers that are running cattle on the field that Jacob has purchased. But there is a young woman named Dinah who at this time is probably around the age of 16. And she's inquisitive and she's watching as daily business happens, as the transactions are taking place. And, and Brother Nathaniel, this girl begins to turn away from the family and she turns unto the world. <laughs> And the first verse of chapter number 34 in the book of Genesis says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. What's the problem, Brother Howell, with me pitching my tent so close to Sodom and Gomorrah? What's the problem with me pitching my tent so close to Shechem? What's wrong with me hanging out with these people on social media? What's wrong with me hanging out with of these people at the water cooler. What's wrong? Evil communications uh, corrupts good manners. Uh, at some point, Dinah decided she needed to do more than sit in an observatory in the house of Jacob uh, and watch what was going on out there in the world. Uh, I wonder how many people right here this morning under the sound of my voice, uh, you've got an observatory in your hand uh, every day of the week uh, and you're Tune it in rather than turn it away from the world. I'm saying you're tuning in rather than turn it away from the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Perhaps she originally started originally as a silent objector. Perhaps she originally said, I'm the daughter of Leah, and that city's not for me. What's going on behind them walls is not for me. But then one day, perhaps a young woman came out with a basket of flowers. And they began to converse. And she says, seems like a good girl. She's got piercings that we don't have. In fact, when our father Jacob said, let's go back to Bethel. He said, bury the jewelry under the oak. And she's a little bit different than us. But oh well, she's a sweet person. And she's got good intentions that she's come out here and begin to make friends. You see, Dinah, what is causing this destruction? What is causing this desolation of mindset? What is causing this destructive mentality that's keeping you from having godliness with contentment, which is great game? What is it that's enticing you? There's things that are inside of that city wall you've never seen. There's idolatry and paganism and things beyond measure. But what is it between the gate of that city and the camp where your father Jacob lives? The things that are in between. Come on now. Are you, are you listening to me? The little sins, the small boxes that destroy the vine. What is it between the little sins 
sin and they grievously sin. You see, there come a time when Dinah walked out of the house of her parents and she said, I'm going to go into town today and I'm going to survey the land and just see what the girls are doing in there. I'm so lonely. I don't fit in. I've only got brothers. I ain't got a sister. And I've got to go make some friends because I'm so lonely. Listen, Dinah, would your loneliness lead to desolation? Would your inquisitiveness lead to desolation? I'm talking about little sins, little discontentments that lead to destruction. What would Dinah say if you asked her this morning, what led to this desolation? Was it going to see the daughters of the land? Wait a minute, Dinah. You're the daughter of Leah. Why do you need to see the daughters of Hamar? Or the daughters of the prince of the land? Why do you have to have a knight on the town? Brother, I just feel like going out by myself and putting my skates back on and going back to that skating rink where all that worldly music is playing. I just feel like going to my class reunion and hanging out with people again. I've been pitching outside of classmates.com and I've been thinking about going back behind the city walls. Hey, come on, you better be careful. I just want to have a night on the town. And the Bible said, while Dinah is with them daughters of the Hivites, the Bible said the prince of Shechem, whose name is Shechem, he took her and defiled her and he humiliated her. There's been a lot of people misread this scripture. And if you read that chapter carefully, you will see that Dinah was not brutally raped. If you read that chapter, you'll notice when Dinah was approached by her father and brothers, Dinah speaks nothing of it. It appears that Dinah has stayed back in the house of Shechem while Hamor and Shechem try to make something right that they done wrong. It does not appear that Dinah is always is against Mary and Shechem. Study it carefully. This modern generation, especially the Me Too movement, they want to use Dinah's rape as a baseline for sermons and messages. But it appears that Dinah was flattered Whenever the prince of Shechem showed her little attention. When he said, I'm Shechem of Shechem. And I'd like to show you a little attention. And she went back with him to his dwelling. And it seems like perhaps maybe he did come upon her forcefully. And he humiliated her and defiled her not only in the sense of rape. Oh, come on now. But a virgin daughter of Jacob who is now Israel. Remember what I'm preaching about, the city of Jerusalem. She's not even supposed to be in the bedchamber of Hamar or Shechem. She's not even supposed to be in their dwelling. Maybe she thought a little kiss would do, and she'd go home with her secret, or she'd go home with her surprise. But her unresponsiveness to this situation lets us know that there was more than what meets the eye. Oh, come on now. You know the Bible said in Lamentations 5 and 21, Turn now unto us, unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned, renew our days as of all these people wanted to be renewed. How can Dinah be renewed? How can Dinah's virginity be restored? She is now morally scarred. Oh, come on now. How did the city of Jerusalem get in the shape spiritually and nationally that they're in? Jeremiah 7 and 28 says, The Lord told Jeremiah to say unto them that this is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished. It is cut off from their mouth. They just can't bring themselves to listen to this message. They just can't bring themselves to listen to the words of their father and mother, even if they are wide words. Come on, the entire book of Jeremiah is chock full of sermons that he preached 
warning people about the consequences of sin. Now when you leave the house of Leah and you go into a foreign country and you find yourself behind city walls and now you've got unwarranted attention and the prince of that land has taken you by force and he's taken you to the house and you thought it was fantastical and you thought it was so blissful and you thought it was just going to be an innocent good dinner date but he expected more do you know he did to Dinah what the children of Israel would do to the captive daughters of their enemies he brought her into his house this represented that he had conquered the house of Jacob. Do you understand, young person, when you walk out of the house of God and you give that that is holy unto the dogs, that it represents that the devil has taken a daughter or a son of Zion. That's what Nebuchadnezzar done. He took Jerusalem by force and humiliated her. But could it not be said that she had played the adulterer and the adulteress with sin? Could it not be said of Jerusalem that she had played the whoredoms? Huh? Oh, come on now in the New Testament book of the Bible. The Bible said, ye adulteresses and adulterers, know ye not that a friendship or a love for this world is to put you in hostility to God, ye adulterers and ye adulteresses. You see, this young woman didn't just stumble into the gate of Shechem. And she didn't just stumble into the arms of Shechem. Hey, the prince of Shechem. And she didn't just stumble into the bedchamber of Shechem. And I'm sure she didn't really think that sin would take her that far. And I'm sure when the bodyguards closed the doors, she knew she was in trouble. Hey, come on, the Bible said he humbled her, he defiled her, and now he's trying to make something right with her father Jacob. And if you study that scripture, the Bible said when Jacob heard the news, he was troubled, and he wanted to make sure he didn't interfere with his son's work. And then after them men come home from work, he set them down, and he said, boys, Dinah's been defiled. The desolation of Dinah. You think with me of the, of the feelings and the emotions as Jacob recites to these brothers that I had a messenger come from the king and Hamer himself coming because something's happened to Dinah. She's been humiliated. This shouldn't have happened to the house of Jacob. This shouldn't have happened to somebody that was a Supposed to be blessed. These things shouldn't happen to somebody on their way to Bethel. It does when you hit the pause button. It does when you decide to browse this and browse that and visit this break room and this chat room. It does when you decide to drink this and participate in that. Oh, come on now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this building right here. Right now, y'all think about that as them brothers begin to chew on their lips. What about Simeon and Levi, her natural born brothers, sons of Leah? What about their feelings and their emotions at this time? The anger. Hamer and Shechem come down now. And them boys are sitting around in a huddle. And they're shaking their heads. And the Bible's clear they're very angry. They don't even want to talk to the mayor of the city of Shechem. They don't want to talk to the prince. And apparently has got their daughter at the house. And had brought them back. I mean, they ain't on speaking terms. Y'all understand? And they're not willing to enter an agreement. I don't care. The Bible said that this man Shechem loved Dinah. This lets me know she had flirted with him. She had tried to win her heart. And he took her because in this day and hour, men would do that. But there's a military thing happening here. It's where Hamar and Shechem are taking possession of all that belongs to Jacob. I know you've never heard it preached like this, but if you really study this chapter in context, you realize these guys are subduing the men of Israel. And the Bible said while they're in there talking, Hamar and Shechem tells Jacob and her brothers how much 
they love her and how she can want her to be his wife. And these guys, they're not in agreement with this. And they come up with a plan. And that plan is have all the men of Shechem circumcised. And while they're still sore, these young men come. And the Bible said during the night. Now y'all listen to this. This is something very important that you remember. After the men of Shechem have been circumcised. And while they're sore and unable to fight. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. They go in and they slay the men of the city. Now listen to this. The Bible said they took their sister Dinah out of that house. Now some people think Dinah was there willfully. I feel like she played with sin and I feel like sin got the best of her and she was taken against her will. I, I've never read this in a book but God showed me that Jerusalem being turned away and Jerusalem being led captive is the same thing that happened with Dinah. You play with fire, you're going to get burned with fire. You chat with somebody in Hawaii and you get on an airplane, you're going to get abducted in Hawaii and they'll find your bones uh, bleached white uh, on a remote desolate island. So I feel like she's like the act. I'm here against my will. I can't believe the things that's happened to me behind closed doors. I can't believe they're taking ownership of me. I can't believe the devil would be my master. I can't believe my people said Jeremiah's going to bow to Nebuchadnezzar. I can't believe my sister. And that's what them brothers Simeon and Levi said. Shall he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Listen, they, she had acted like one. Perhaps she had dressed like one. Maybe she had modified her wardrobe so she could fit in. But she never expected to fall this far that she would be well her virginity in a house of mourning and walk off the pages of the sacred writ. Are y'all getting this here this morning? I'm telling our young people, if you turn from Jerusalem, if you turn from the city of God, and you turn to Hamer and Shechem, and you turn to this world, don't be shocked when you're held captive against your will. Church, it took Jerusalem, the people had been chosen of the Lord. It took them sincerely repenting of their sins with godless sorrow. This is the kind of repentance that will bring spiritual renewal. And so I want you to know the first four chapters of this book of Lamentation is weeping and wailing and lamenting. But the last chapter, what I'm preaching right here this morning, Lamentations 5 and 21, our text, if you'll turn from that and turn unto God. I kind of feel like Dinah was probably standing at the window after that old nasty, filthy thing had just made her one of his concubines. And she realized, I'm bound. And there's a guard outside that building. And I'll never be in the house of sweet Leah again. I'll never be in the house of Brother uh, Simeon and Brother Levi again. I'll never stand in the church house with Brother Samuel Howe again. I'll never stand shoulder to shoulder with Brother Jeremiah Howe again. I'll never know what it's like to sit by Hannah Lynn Howe again. I'll never know what it's like to see Sister Wooten shout again. And Dinah's probably got tears running down her face and then she hears the noise of war. Spiritual war if you would. Jerusalem is time to be restored. Somebody's at an altar of repentance. And somebody his heart is broken and somebody's saying God I need restoration I'm preaching this morning home from desolation to restoration and here come two seemingly instruments of cruelty they came in they had a plan and they rescued Dinah listen I'm telling you Jesus he died on instruments of cruelty he died on an old rugged cross and he came to save your life and to liberate you from addiction and to set you free. I said it came to set the captive free. You think with me about 
fact is, Donna didn't resist the opportunity to go home. Young people, there came a time in Jerusalem's history when they no longer wanted to dwell in desolation. They welcomed the opportunity for restoration. Preaching on from desolation to restoration. These people enter a personal plea for the Lord to help us. Help me, God. You think about this, Brother Rocap. In Lamentations 5 and 21, he said, God turned to me. God turned to me. Lord, I turned away from you. Now I'm facing you. Turn to me, God. How many of you know the Bible said, My spirit shall not always strive with me. But God, turn back to me. Turn your face. He said, If you'll seek me, you'll find me. You draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. Now they're saying, turn now us unto thee, O God. Turn now us unto thee. What they're saying is, Lord, things I can't control. I want you to take the controls of my life and turn me back to you. Take me by the head and turn me, rotate me. 180 degrees, turn now us unto thee, O Lord. Our brother, hey, James, he in chapter number 4, verse number 8, he said, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded as long as Dinah was double-minded and indecision. She was not able to get back to where God intended for her to be. The people of Jerusalem had been double-minded. In our text, we hear them pleading with the Lord to turn unto them. They said, if he turns unto us, we shall be turned and our days shall be renewed and we can return to who and what we used to be. Can I tell us that Dinah did not regain her virginity and Dinah never did Mary that we know of and nothing else has ever said but at least she was back among the people of God in the family of God come on now I know you've done some things that have scarred you and even removed you from the possibility of ministry but just to be with the people of God just to be numbered with the people of God oh Come on now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this building. In our text, we hear them pleading with the Lord. Are you pleading with God? God, I've done some things I shouldn't have done, but I'm asking you to not take your spirit from me. I'm asking you, God, not to let me live in the land of whoredoms and idolatry. I'm asking you, God, let me live in the family of God. You know, the Bible said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-mindedness to me equates to spiritual adultery. I want to serve God, and I want to serve mammon. I want to have fresh water, and I want to have salty water. I want to have sweet water, and I want to have bitter water. You cannot serve God and mammon. You'll hold the one and despise the other. Now, listen. Dinah is trying to keep Mama Leah's apron strings in one hand and the gate of Shechem in the other. And Shechem has a stronger pull than you think it does. And this is why we should not be pitching our tents near Sodom and Gomorrah or Shechem. How many remember the night the Lord saved your soul? We sang it this morning. I can tell you the time I can take you to the place when the Lord saved me. Do you remember how squeaky clean you felt the night that the Lord saved you? You see this text is saying, Lord, turn me. Now what stood out to me in the inspiration for this sermon is turn. If you would underline that in your mind, turn. There was a time when they were facing the Lord and they were worshiping the Lord. Anybody that faces the Lord can't help but worship Him. Uh, but they turned their backs on God. Didn't the Lord say, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. He will turn his back on some at the judgment day. And this is amazing. These are words that he's going to speak to some. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, that those people would have returned. The nation of Israel's got to return. Dinah's got to return. What's the return? So get that. They had turned. But once they return, turn back to where they had left, they can be renewed. They can be restored to the 
their previous condition, the Lord can help them rebuild their nation and families. Church, this country needs revival. This country needs restoration. And I'm preaching this morning on from desolation to restoration. And we can have the end time revival if we will repent. You know what Jeremiah was weeping about, Brother Nathaniel? Why he was crying the way he was crying? Why he was preaching the way he was preaching? Would y'all please just turn back to God? Would you please value good morals? Would you please appreciate virtue? Would you please, please like wholesome activity? Would you please have a pure conscience? Would you please have a clean mind? Would you please refuse to defile yourself? With the things of the world, Dinah. Would you please stay out of Shechem, Dinah? Would you please stay off of that YouTube page? Would you please stay off of that chat room? Would you please stop accepting every friend that comes your way? Come on, listen, listen a little bit deep. Would you, would you see you need to be renewed? Would you see that you need to be that person again in the house of God with warm tears flowing down your face? Clenching a, a tissue in your hand and saying, God has been so good. I love you, Lord. I may have been defiled, but the devil's not going to keep me. I, I may have been diverted, but I've turned back. I might have been perverted, but I've been renewed. Oh, come on, Jeremiah. I wanted to see the people come back to God. The idolatry and spiritual adulterers had to go back to God. Church, we must turn our backs on some things. We cannot look back. The Bible said, a penny man set his hand on the plow, and he looks back. He's not fit for the kingdom of God. I dare say whenever Simeon and Levi were dragging Dinah out of the land of Shechem, she was not saying, let me go. I want to stay. Oh, no. Lot's wife looked back, and we know the example that she left behind. I'm telling somebody right here in the sound of my voice, you've got to determine in your mind you're not going to defile yourself with this world. Turn to God. Tune in to God. Our brother read Revelations 2, 4, and 5 the other night. It spoke of those who had left their first love. I believe, I believe it was Brother Thomas Sterrett who read that to us. Had left their first love. It says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. And repent and do the first works. Dinah, remember. Remember. You fell out of the camp of Jacob. Jerusalem, remember, you were that city that sat in a solitary place, but now you're just rubble in heaps. Our text says, though, there's a cry coming now. Remember us, O oh God. David shall remember me, O oh God. They said, renew our days as of old when I came to church, speaking in tongues when I walked to the door. I was shouting a victory. The songwriter said, bring back the new again. I want to see you again. Bring back the way of was when we began bring back the new again oh that first love that you walked away from Dinah that mama named Leah and that daddy named Jacob and those brothers that loved you enough to die for you church I'm telling you we've got a brother named Jesus Christ that loved us enough to die for us I'm saying right here this morning there's somebody more desolate spiritually then you're acting like uh, in this morning in this altar you can find restoration if you'll just turn back to God. Turn back to your first love. Turn from sin to God. Let's look ahead at what the future can be and let's don't dwell on the past. This text speaks of the possibility of forgiveness. Oh, thank God. The Lord's not willing that any should perish. The Lord doesn't want Dinah stuck behind the walls of Shechem. The Lord doesn't want Dinah stuck in the arms of Shechem or under the authority of Hamor. You see, Hamor told them, he said, we'll intermarry. And y'all know what the Bible said, light and darkness have no fellowship. There's no concord between Christ and Belial. There's no agreement. Are y'all getting this this morning? And this pretty much totally destroys the doctrines 
that most preachers preach every Sunday morning in their pulpits. We can see that we can have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but that we're supposed to reprove them. And we're not even supposed to camp outside of their camp. Amen. But the good news is if we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we have fallen out of the arms of a loving father or mother. We've fallen out of the arms of a loving God. We can find that there is possibility of forgiveness. This is why a lot of prodigals refuse to come home. Because they don't really believe there's a possibility of forgiveness. Or a possibility of restoration. Or a possibility of renewal. How many of you know God can fix it so good. It would be as though it's never been broken. Restoration means think of repairing an old house. And bringing it back to its original state. However, biblically, restoration means to me to receive back more than what has been lost to the point where the final state is greater than the original condition. I've seen some people that have went out into the world and been broken by the devil come back stronger than they were before they left. It all has to do with your heart and your spirit. The Bible says said the prodigal son he came back and got a full restoration I'm telling somebody here this morning you've got to believe in the possibility of a full restoration Woo! what'd you lose son well I lost it all how'd you lose it I squandered it well the good news is I've got the sonship ring right here the one you left behind, son. Remember when you didn't want to be my son? Remember when you wondered how it felt like dying to be the wife of a prince of Shechem? Remember when you toyed with the idea of being the daughter-in-law of Hamer, the mayor of Shechem? Huh? Remember, prodigal son, when you toyed with the idea of just thriving in this world and being somebody in this world? Hey, when you thought about your name flashing in lights in Hollywood? When you thought about you being a star on Broadway, hey, but now I'm telling you, that ring you thought you didn't want, I've got it right here. I'm going to put on the ring of sonship. That way when you walk through town, everybody knows you're my boy. Huh? You go into the marketplace and they see that ring come out. It says, put it on daddy's tab. Say, boy, where you been? I know I've been gone a long time. The rumor is you've been gone away into a far country. And the boy says there's too many stories to tell. But the past is the past. And I'm living in a brand new day. And I'm back and I've got the royal robe on. I'm back now. I'm a child of God. I'm in a robe of righteousness. I'm a child. I'm a son and a daughter of God. I'm telling somebody right here under the sound of my voice. It doesn't matter what's happened to you in the far country. It doesn't matter the scars that are so deep that nobody really knows about. I'm telling you, the robe of righteousness will cover the scars of sin for a season. Woo! What about Ruth and Naomi? Naomi, too, allowed her husband to lead her into the land of Moab. And they went out there and pitched their tent in the camp of Moab. And we find that sin does cost us more than we wanted to pay and keep us longer than we want to stay. And we noticed that Naomi, she was a good influence to Ruth. And for the sake of time, I'm hurrying here. But you know what? Ruth was watching Naomi. And she realized that there was something about this woman from that other world. There was something about this holy woman. This woman of old, this woman that had righteousness about her, this wholesome personality. And she decided that she wanted to go with Naomi back to the land of bread after there had been so much desolation in the house of Elimelech and Naomi and including the house of Ruth. She's lost her out of worship and husband. She's buried him. She's visited this gravesite for the last time. She's laid down her bouquet for the last time. And Ruth believes in restoration and she trails Naomi back to the house of bread. Listen, it's the act of restoring, the act of renewal, revival, and get this, reestablishment. After the defiling of Dinah, Jacob went back to Bethel. 
brothers and sisters, he didn't want to tarry outside the gate of Shechem anymore when it got Dinah back. You look at the next chapters, you'll find out Jacob packed up his bags and got to doing what God told him to do. And I'm telling you, when Naomi realized she couldn't prosper in the land of Moab, she packed up her bags and went to the land of restoration. You can't be restored in Shechem. You can't be restored in Moab. You've got to go back to Bethel or Bethlehem for there to be restoration. And what I mean by that is you go back to God. It's terrible to realize as we stand this morning to realize that Dinah was not content to remain at home. She curiously went out to see what her neighbors were doing. Now with me only having recovered from COVID for a few days or weeks, I was positive for COVID the first of August, see? And here I'm preaching this morning. I'm not supposed to have the lung power I have. You hear how winded I am right now? But when that anointing comes, and I know this morning that I'm preaching to somebody, maybe pre-desolation, maybe mid-desolation, or maybe post-desolation. We want to debate all this stuff about the end times. But what we really need to do is go back and look at the city of Jerusalem and say, are they pre-desolation, mid-desolation, or post-desolation? And Jeremiah looks at the ruins and the rubble. Simeon and Levi look at the ruins and the rubble. And they believe in restoration. Now, y'all notice something with me as I take you through the Word of God one more time. In that 34th chapter of the book of Genesis, you see a role change. Them young men... It's the brothers to Dinah begin to take authority. And Jacob says very little. Jacob backs up to see how they're going to handle this. Because the heritage of the Lord, that's wonderful. That's great. But we're looking to see what you're going to do with it. Because Jacob realizes I've got one more trip to make, and that's to Bethel. But if they ain't with me, What's the use? Uh, and I know that Jacob attempted to curse Simeon and Levi for their actions. And he said that they did that unjustly and that they deceived them men and lied and got what they wanted. But I can tell you something, Brother Nathaniel, the way I see it, they were outnumbered and I can't help but that the wisdom of the Holy Ghost helped them outwit their enemy. I felt the anointing of God right there. But Dinah, you've got a problem when I see you in that personal observatory and somebody can be taking a picture of somebody else and they could be taking a picture of scenery. And they could be doing something, just whatever, just off the cuff. But every time they see you, you got your observatory. It's deep preaching. You just think about it. Look at it right now. Right now, you think about yourself. Look at yourself right now. See yourself right now in the name of Jesus. Are you pitching your tent to Shechem? Because when you turn from Jacob, you turn unto Shechem. Are you pitching your tent toward Shechem? I asked some holiness people one time. I said, where'd you learn that style? Where'd you learn to do that? How'd you know how to say that? Where'd you learn that phrase? Well, I learned it from the girls that were going outside of the city to deposit waste on the hillside. Where did you learn? I remember when you talked like a daughter of Israel. 
I remember when a second was a second, a minute was a minute, an hour was an hour. I remember when gay was to describe somebody that's happy. I remember when a rainbow signified the promise of God that still does. Diana curiously went out to see what her neighbors were doing. Listen, I'm not curious about what other holiness people are doing. I could care less. I'm not even curious about what used to be holiness preachers are doing that are now false prophets. That's deep. The Bible said Jacob had bought some land from Hamar and Shechem and pitched his tent there. Now, I wish every daughter of this church, Bethel Holmes Church, was present this morning. But Dinah's heart is revealed to us by her decisions and direction. Dinah's heart is revealed to us by her decisions and directions. As Brother Jesse comes to the piano this morning, I've deliberately slowed down to see if we could be honest with ourselves. Are you really thriving spiritually, young person, or are you desolate spiritually? You see, she flirted with Shechem, the prince of Shechem. And he wooed her, Brother Jeremiah. And then he humiliated her. And you flirt with this world. And they woo you. And then they humiliate you. There's a sweet presence of the Lord here this morning. But there's no greater honor than to be a child of God. Right. Now, Brother Rocap, I'm sure when Dinah walked in to just the makeshift courtyard of Jacob's tent, I'm sure she walked in and fell on her mother's shoulder and wept and cried. And Leah said, Girl, you got yourself in a mess. Simeon and Levi had sheathed them swords and they probably had little to say to Dinah other than this girl don't ever get yourself in that mess again now I feel the Holy Ghost in this building but there's some of us if we don't listen carefully to what Pastor Howell has laid out before us this morning we're going to find ourselves in desolation if you don't stop you're going to find yourself destroyed. But I want to believe that really there's somebody this morning that's going to be like Ruth. Ruth's restoration. Dinah's desolation. But Ruth's restoration, I believe there's going to be somebody here this morning that's going to get in the altar and say, Lord, remember me. Forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry. Lord, I want to destroy my personal observatory. Is there somebody right now as we all bow our heads and close our eyes? Is there somebody right now as the Holy Ghost witnesses and moves? Is there somebody say, Preacher, I look good. I looked apart. But inside I can tell I've been heading in the wrong direction. Would you raise your hand right now? One. Two, three, four, five. That's how many I thought this morning. Diana, don't do it. Let's find a place to pray. And I ask the Bethel Holiness Church to please don't quench the spirit as the Holy Ghost moves this morning. Diana. May we ask you why you were not content to remain at home? Why'd you let your curiosity cause you to see what the neighbors were doing? Who cares what the neighbors are doing? Who cares anyway what the neighbors are doing? For every diner that walks out, 
There's a Ruth walking in. Restore us, oh God. Restore us. Your decisions and direction. You're taking Donna lets us know the condition of your heart. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Five people raised their hand. And made some bad decisions and walking in the wrong direction. Five people this morning.